uh, economic status of you, goes to a Goodwill and is like, oh, okay, you know, this is a great deal. I got these brand new pants and, you know, they're $5. Um, but not all the clothing uh, ends up that way, right? So, or maybe that person buys it from Goodwill, then they discard it again. And so then tons of this clothing is actually then redistributed throughout the world to countries where people are, um, you know, initially uh, the labor force behind making them. So lots of clothing goes back to Africa, lots of clothing goes to um, Southeast, Southeast Asia. So part of the reason why there's a redistribution of the clothing at the end is to kind of uh, follow this path. And it's not to say that people are poor and they're getting the clothes, although that sometimes that happens. They can't economically afford to purchase clothing for their whole family. But it's, it's more just to mimic, to, to sort of mimic this uh, cycle of, you know, globalized goods kind of traveling throughout the world. So things we sort of see as use, useless um, pop up in different places. Say, for instance, you know, I spent some time in Thailand and you would go to the markets there and they'd be filled with t-shirts with U.S. Uh, slogans like <laughs> 5K runs and, um, you know, things they are just like, well, obviously, they, you know, the, some foundation isn't doing a 5K run in um, Bangkok or something like that. So, you know, you see these goods traveling back and forth and um, um, so, yeah, so that's, that's one thing that's happening. Um, there's also a reference to craft in the work, which um, probably seems pretty obvious. And um, basically, what happens is when I come to the site, I turning the I basically turn the room into a loom. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know you need a few things for weaving, and one of the things is you need a loom. And so the walls in this space act as a as the loom, and then you need to string the loom, and which is, you know, you can see it's the wire cable. So I, 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 in this piece, I kept some of the wire cable cable visible, so you could see the construction, but also to reference kind of the idea of uh, drawing in space. And the cables then become the second part of weaving, which is called the warp. So you need a loom, you need a warp. Um, and then the last part that you need to do a weaving is called the weft, which is what the clothing is. So the clothing is tied together, and sometimes we, because I'm working with other people, we sort of just like randomly would pick a pattern, like, okay, the first pattern was tie a white, a white piece of clothing to a black piece and then to a blue because, you know, you end up with large amounts of certain colors and I don't necessarily want to make some sections monochromatic, so, you know, how do you sp spread the color throughout the, throughout the piece? And then other times, like towards the end, you know, we just like, okay, you just can tie three pieces of clothing together that just using your own sensibilities. So very, very, very random. And uh, so, so the tied together clothing becomes the weft and then the weft gets woven through the warp. And it's really, really very simple. It's just like over and under, over and under. And uh, there's a great uh, YouTube animation if you did like cardboard loom, a search for, that animates basically what I've done in, the, in a, a more 2D-ish sort of way. So it's, um, it's a lot of labor and a lot of repetition, just like standard weaving is. Um, but then the weaving also references how the how the clothing was made, and also um, you know a source of labor practice that's been with us for a really really um, long time and exists in you know almost all cultures, whether it's like basket making or weaving clothing or um, cloth. So um, yeah. I have a question for you. I have a very architectural response to the installation in terms of shelter, comfort, memory, that kind of thing, but I don't see that you uh, reference it in your art statement. Can you speak to the architectural side of your work? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's true, like, uh, I think this, this kind of work does address the site architecturally, and I'm kind of interested in how do you juxtapose, how do you juxtapose the human body against mm -hmm. the architecture? Like this, uh, the, just the scale. So most, um, 
most uh, structures we're in, right, are just huge and monumental and we're sort of dwarfed by them. So I kind of, I enjoy this idea of actually people becoming more massive and monumental than the architecture of the space. And um, because of the tension on the cables, then the, the piece uh, actually, or, you know, if you're sort of seeing the clothing as a, uh, figuratively, um, the piece also starts to kind of challenge the physicality of the space and actually the space's ability to uh, maintain itself. You know, buildings kind of seem impossibly huge and, uh, um, you know, sort of very difficult to kind of take down. I mean, I'm not, so there's, I mean, there is a little bit of confrontation in the work and what I'm trying to do, but it's more about um, it's as opposed to the space always taking precedence over the humans that operate in them. I mean, I sort of feel like people define a place or a location or a space. Um, but a lot of times I think, um, you know, I don't know if it's appropriate to bring up, but I mean, I sort of think about the community college or the education system right now in California, and you see plenty of, I mean, I've been on multiple campuses this year doing projects, and every single one of them has large construction projects going on. And yet students seem to be really suffering about how to take classes or they can't get a class or their classes being canceled or um, fees being, you know, Cal State fees being really um, uh, jacked up in, in big ways. So, uh, you know, there, there seems to be a cultural precedent for buildings more than people and so I guess I'm trying to turn, turn things around a little bit. Does anyone have any questions, like even the most obvious ones, or <laughs> did anyone here donate some of the clothing? Did, did you come? Maybe I see one person. One other thing I've seen in your process that I seem to notice when I was in here earlier and watching you through the time is you seem to choose to use separate strings to bind the clothes together rather than to use the clothes to tear them to use them or bind them to one another separately. Right. Why are you why are you making that kind of a choice in your construction? Well, I'm part of it's practical in the sense of I, I know that the piece has to come apart and I'd like it to come apart with the clothes in as intact as possible. And sometimes you know, and you have to tie things pretty tightly so that they don't because you're, you know, you have to pull on the clothes a little bit to weave them so it's not too saggy and tight. And so by doing an individual strand, you, it makes it a little bit easier to take them apart. Whereas if you tied the tie clothes really tight, it would, with, like, say, a shirt sleeve to a shirt sleeve, it, it be then becomes really difficult to get it apart. Um, so, yeah, it's a um, pretty, pretty bunch of practical, I guess, consideration. And then it also allows you to see, I think, um, that form of labor that went into uh, that went into the piece. That each of these, it's obvious that each of these pieces were put together. Where maybe if it seemed more continuous, you would maybe think they were sewn or mm -hmm. you know um, joined together in another way. So I can answer a question that usually always comes up. <laughs> in case uh, I'm going to start asking you all questions. <laughs> Edith, when did you start weaving clothes in in this way? How did or how did that come about? Uh, uh, well, I actually it's probably in like uh, 2005 was the first time I did a clothing weaving, and it was a collaboration with another artist whose name is Betsy Laura Hall, and we were asked to do an installation. Um, in a small community gallery in um, Northeast Los Angeles. And, you know, collaborations are some, uh, her and I have lots of similarities uh, with, with our work. Like, mine has much more political content, but material-wise it's very um, similar sometimes in some of the issues we're addressing. So, you know, we talked and tried to figure out some things that we could do. And, um, you know, somehow we came up with the idea of using clothes and then uh, we're, I, I really don't know how we stumbled upon it, but basically originally we had made 
kind of large suspended baskets in the space. Mm -hmm. And they, I didn't use any cables, and they're much uh, softer and had less uh, uh, definite form. Mm -hmm. And um, we also had lots of clothes that were on the floor that people could just come in and take. And there was an audio component where we recorded people's stories about their clothing. Mm -hmm. So in that, that particular piece, it was more about uh, the stories or the narrative that clothing represents, which, I mean, uh, so, uh, so from there, you know, it's, I guess the next year, it's maybe 2008, someone saw a slide of the work and then asked if I could do something similar in their space. So you have, uh, you know, once again, you have these practical considerations. That place was sort of like here where it had a wood beam ceiling, but this place was not that at all. They had a drop ceiling with concrete beams, and they're like, well, you know, I mean, this is where it's probably going to get blurry, <laughs> but <laughs> unless you're like a preparator. But uh, so, anyways, they, they're like, you know, you could go through the drop ceiling, you could drill through the concrete, and it's just like, oh, come on, no way. Like, that's, you know, I mean, this is a lot of labor, but that's a lot of hard work. So, um, but they did have walls that had plywood behind the drywall. And so, I talked with um, some preparators, and I talked with a friend of mine who's a contractor, and basically just started drilling them as to like, okay, this is what I want to do, and I need to have the tension really tight, and then sp you know the walls need to still be able to stay up, and I have to be able to do it, and this and that. So basically, we came up with a you know like the suspension bridge idea, um, and you know it's. it's the first piece I did was uh, also horizontal, it intersected the space, um, and it was about 40 feet long, and took me like a month. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> because part of it was just like going, well, what's going to work, you know, how can we get enough tension? And, um, so that, that was like the first um, kind of incarnation of this, and then... And then from there, I've done it at a couple other spaces, but not every space is appropriate to do this in. So here, it's really fortunate your your walls of the gallery are wood. So, uh, yeah. Do you work from preparatory sketches, or does it kind of come to life in the space, strictly in the installation, in terms of the composition and the things that you make? I think it's a it's a little bit of both. I definitely try to visit the site. Um, more than once, although I, I think I, I did only come to this site once, but I take a lot of photos and um, try to envision a way that the piece can respond to the space. And, and then also just some formal concerns that I have. Like, um, and, um, and then when I'm in the space, um, sometimes there's practical considerations that I didn't think of, and sometimes you get in the space and you're just like, oh, there would be a way better way that this would that this would make sense or that this would that this could happen. And then of course, even working on the piece. I mean, it's just like if you do a painting or a drawing or a sculpture. As you're working on it, you get ideas and people talk to you and give you input and then you're like, well, now I have like uh, 200 versions of this <laughs> that I could do just in this space. Um, and uh, and then you're kind of, you know, uh, you're just like, wow, maybe I should have tried that one instead. But, you know, part of, part of I think, doing site-specific work or even anything is you just you really have to make decisions and um, stick to them and not constantly second-guess yourself in the process. Um, so then the color-wise and the clothing and the textures, that's just all unknown. And, I mean, that's kind of an exciting part. And how does that... How do you put all those things together? Um, and, um, you know, I sort of think that's where it would be great to really have some painting skills with the color end of things. <laughs> my, uh, my, my use of color isn't as good as I'm sure other people's would be. And so those are things that I've tried to address formally, too, with my work. Um, I've tried to do things where there's, like, just kind of monochromatic blocks of color, and it just um, doesn't seem to look as it just doesn't seem to have the same look or the same dynamic. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, that's the. Um, so I think I think that it's it's like a little bit over 1,100 pieces of clothing, so. which is probably like the size of some people's wardrobes. <laughs> you know, it seems a lot to most of us, but I think you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a friend who's a vintage clothing dealer who's just like you know, this is like probably a fraction of like what's in his basement, but. Uh, yeah, it, I think it's the mass that makes it seem really um, a lot. I mean, it's still a lot. It's a lot to haul around and to tie together. You know, there is a physicality to the work. Does anyone here do installation work? Or is interested in doing installation work? They might be now, but they are probably <laughs> just percolating. <laughs> Are, is, are most everyone in here art, art majors or planning on being having art, art pursuits? <laughs> yeah. 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 How many people have been to the gallery before? Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> so we can All right. What kind of advice would you give to students who want to pursue a career in art? Uh, but, uh, well, start, um, start making connections now. <laughs> no. Um, no, I mean, there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of amazing resources in your school and with your faculty. Um, it's really, it's really important to, um, you know, like, making work is important, but also the social connection of the art world is very important. Um, and I mean, I sort of feel a little bit cheesy saying that, like, but it, it really it really goes a far it really goes a far way. And uh, just being really serious about what you do, because um, if you think you're working hard, there's uh, there's a lot of people who are working way harder than you are, and uh, it's a really competitive field, but it's incredibly rewarding. And I think we're um, as artists, we're pretty fortunate that every kind of discipline is at our disposal. I mean, we don't, we're not in, we're not artists in a time where all we're doing is making paintings for the church. That, that's the only way to make a living. So there's artists who are, you know, at, at Antarctica, um, working with scientists down there to, um, uh, you know, people doing very labor intense traditional sorts of paintings and uh, if you have interests that you think are divergent if you probably google that <laughs> with art as like also a keyword you'll probably find many people doing something with that so. Yeah. so just stick to it I mean it's really about perseverance even though it's you know it can be it can be hard and uh, sort of solitary but uh, well um, it's, I mean, I could sort of, I, I could give this trajectory that probably would be boring, but, uh, my father was a painter, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't interested in pursuing art until, like, I was maybe in my, um, early 20s, and had gone to the university on a kind of academic path, um, and then, uh, just decided, like, oh, I'm going to try this art stuff. I mean, I know it sounds very flippant because there are plenty of artists who, like, they knew when they were, like, two years old they were going to be artists. But I didn't necessarily see it as a viable possibility um, until uh, I saw other career choices as unviable. And uh, that, uh, so, you know, you kind of just, like, well, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And, um, I started taking art classes at a community college and was really fortunate to have uh, um, educators that were really um, enthusiastic and just uh, passionate about the um, passionate about the field. And I started out taking all kinds of classes, photography, ceramic, just everything, drawing, painting, and was always sort of always all over the place. And then um, yeah, started making artist books and then went from artist books to making quilts using books and then it just the you know, it just sort of got got bigger and then offered um, opportunities to um, do larger scale work in people's faces who really support 
installation art like Marshall, who's here. <laughs> Anyways, uh, off camera, Marshall's a curator and he's very supportive of people who do uh, this kind of work. So, um, you know, just getting opportunities and then, um, you know, being able to realize those things. So, but it was a slow, you know, from really small eight and a half by eleven books or five and a half by eight and a half to this. So, you know, not you know, very different, I guess. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments? That would be nice to hear. <laughs> like what you think of the piece? Oh, I, I'll share. I shared okay. with you. Um, a lot of kids probably do this, but I said what came to my mind was, and I hadn't thought about this and I don't even know when, but um, making like little forts with chairs and blankets over them and you can crawl under them. That kind of reminded me of the space. It's really interesting, the memories that kind of come up from from the space too. Right. It's kind yeah. of fun. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of like everyday kind of domestic issues that might work. So, yeah. No, it, no, it is. Yeah. You know, all through high school, and I kind of, oh my gosh, well, totally, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the time when I was always at this board meeting. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of clothing that's pretty musty. And, uh, I mean, that's another thing that's always could keep this problematic. <laughs> I was trying to think I of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no. um, I really like clothing that shows a lot of wear and use. <laughs> and so, um, probably what's really interesting to me might not be interesting to other people. But I think one of one of the most sort of fabulous. Uh, there's a couple really fabulous pieces that um, were donated, and one is a was a uh, sequin dress. And it was a very like sexy, short, stretchy, um, silver, completely <laughs> all silver sequin dress. And uh, the person who gave it to me, she's just like, yeah, I don't wear that anymore. And um, <laughs> but it was this, it was, I mean, it was like uh, bedazzling, like the, <laughs> the, the craft thing, right? Like you, you just looked at it and you're just like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> and then um, at the same time, there was a. Uh, a really beautiful, like vintage um, blue velvet coat um, <coughs> that was probably like maybe from the 40s or something with, you know, uh, kind of fuchsia, uh, kind of a yeah, sort of like a fuchsia uh, satin lining. Just, just like a beautiful thing to really look at. And uh, during the, there was many people who asked me if they could get that piece, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because all the clothing gets, you know, people can take whatever they want. And I was like, well, yeah, that, that'd be something to keep. <laughs> <laughs> that would be ours. Yeah. You're in there. So I do try to keep a couple garments from, uh, from each one. I mean, there are some really unusual pieces that's sort of hard to see. There's like some satin, that blue satin gown, which is just completely stained, but I'm not sure what happened if the person like decided to. <laughs> in a picnic bench or something in it, or it just is just really odd, but, you know, the fabric's really nice, and there's all this work on it, and, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of other really, um, we have a lot of bras in here, which we were having fun with. <laughs> <laughs> the largest bras you have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Big OC lady. <laughs> so, um. Any wedding gowns? I would think that would. I yeah, mean, there is one. Is there's there? one here. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I, I, I usually get at least one <laughs> for each. Sometimes, uh, I think uh, one of them I had like five. Mm -hmm. So, but this was I collected a lot of clothing, mm -hmm. like five thousand pieces. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you find a very kind of regional difference in clothes collecting depending on where you're doing your installation, mm -hmm. or is um, there kind of an amalgamation with similar? From side to side to side, yeah, like I had originally, I thought that maybe there would be some major distinctions, um, but in general, um, it's pretty. There's there's some slight variations. Like sometimes you get uh, more high quality clothing and maybe less clothes that have been worn so much. Um, but in general, it's it's kind of the same. It's 
mm -hmm. um, uh, stuff that people probably, you know, like you find some really rare gems. Um, but in general, it's kind of stuff that, you know, people aren't going to wear anymore or it got damaged or, um, like I said, it, it didn't fit or um, there's not so much. Uh, occasionally, I get pieces that are maybe from other countries. You know, people collected these clothes on their travels throughout the world and said, okay, they're going to get rid of it. But, yeah, in, in general, lots of denim. Lots of lots. Of people wear lots of blue jeans, obviously. Um, lots of t-shirts. <laughs> lots of t-shirts. Mm -hmm. Things that are, I think, easy for people to. Um, so, I mean, even if you just cut them up in rags, which we don't really do that anymore either. Like that's a whole other <laughs> side of stuff. <laughs> One thing I find interesting though is um, when I was a kid, I used to make those pot holders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I love it because it reminds me of that, like, on a scale. It is. I mean, it's the same, it's, the same, it's basically the same idea. Yeah. Yeah, there's an artist who actually makes pot holders with socks. <laughs> and she, it's it's kind of, you know, a participatory thing. She gets people to bring in their socks, and then she uses those kids' looms, mm -hmm. and you just cut the cut the socks and then string them up. But it, it's exactly the same idea. It's just the scale is bigger. It's a simple weave. There's no fancy weaving happening here. So. I don't know about simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure. Great. All right. Well, I guess that seems, seems good. But thank you, everybody. Thank so. you, Aiden. <laughs> oh, yes, yes.